In this episode of Real Christianity, I continue my teaching on the doctrine of total depravity and why no man can come to God on his own. This is a central Christian doctrine, and I encourage you to grab your Bible, pay attention, and get ready for some powerful truths. All that and more coming up right now. Welcome to Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. Today's episode is titled Romans 3, 13 through 18, Total Depravity, The Wickedness of Humanity. Now, as you guys know, this is an audio and video ministry of relearn.org. If you're watching the video, uh, please be sure to subscribe, follow along for more biblical content. If you're listening from Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify, thank you guys for your faithful listenership. And do you follow the ministry on Instagram or follow me personally on Twitter? Instagram is the place where I curate daily content and post valuable resources. My Twitter is an absolute firestorm of theological warfare, and I would love to have you on the journey. Now, if you're new here, Uh, I want you to know something that most people don't know. Ministries like us typically generate about 70% of our revenue between October and December. And honestly, it's very difficult for ministries like us to plan because it's so difficult to forecast our financial future. Now, to be clear, we're, we're never operating with extra cash in the ministry world. We, we have hundreds of faithful donors, but we still operate on a pretty tight budget. Uh, one very helpful way that you guys can support our ministry is by creating a subscription donation of about $10 or more. You can do this right now at relearn.org forward slash donate. You can cancel at any time, but we would certainly be blessed by your support and promise to be faithful with your contributions. Again, that's relearn.org forward slash donate. All right, guys, we are going to dive in Today, we're going to be covering part two of our two-week series on the sermon called Total Depravity, Why No Man Can Come to God. That was part one. This is the part two, uh, the wickedness of humanity. Now, if this was one sermon, it would be broken down into three sections. Uh, Last episode, you heard us cover uh, section one and section two, which is the universal condemnation of men, which is verses uh, chapter three, verses nine through 10 and the universal condition of man, which is verses 10 through 12. Today, we're going to be talking about the universal acts of men, which is verses 13 through 18. Now, last week, uh, we talked all about the total depravity and what that really looks like, uh, that doctrine in a pretty deep capacity. Uh, In reviewing sermons of other theologians on this same passage of scripture, I saw one gentleman from the 1800s, outline this section this way, and I really appreciated it. He had it as the general charge of unrighteousness, the disordered heart, the disordered words, disordered actions, the cause of the disordering. Now, I appreciated his outline because um, the emphasis was on when you have an unregenerate heart, that essentially that will lead to defective thinking, and that defective thinking will lead to defective living. And so it's really this waterfall cascading effect that begins in the heart. And so if the heart is sick, everything else is sick as well. And that's really what Paul is getting at in this passage of scripture. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. Uh, Luke 6.45, Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Uh, Mark uh, 7, 21 to 23, Jesus says, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. So in scripture, uh, the heart of man is often closely related or even synonymous with the soul of man. Uh, It depends on the passage of scripture and the context. In the journal of the Society of Biblical Literature of Exegesis, this is from 1882, uh, I found this really great paragraph. It says, in the great majority of its occurrences in the scriptures, the word heart is used figuratively. 
It is said to stand for the, quote, central part in general, the inside, and so for the interior man as manifesting himself in all of his various activities, in all his desires, affections, emotions, passions, purposes, his thoughts, perceptions, imaginations, his wisdom, knowledge, skills, his beliefs, and his reasonings, his memory, and his consciousness, end quote. So in short, uh, we have to learn that that when the heart and the soul of a man is unregenerate, uh, that his soul is dead because his soul is separated from the source of life, which is God, uh, that only death will flow out of him. That's essentially the teaching that we're going to be hitting today, is that when the heart is dead and the heart is disconnected, unregenerate, the soul is separated from its life source, that it is dead and therefore only death will come out of that individual because the source, the heart, is dead. When that person is alive and life is flowing, then life will be coming out of this individual. And so uh, the greatest prayer, I would say, in the entire Psalter, in the book of Psalms, is Psalm 5110, which reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Without this prayer being answered, a man first cannot be righteous, we know that, uh, but they cannot see, they cannot understand, and they cannot behave properly. Uh, And so this is why I believe it's really just an essential prayer, because it is the starting point to salvation, regeneration, fruitfulness, faithfulness, and life. Uh, Jesus speaks to those who have been given a new heart in Matthew uh, 5, 8. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, Ultimately, a regenerated heart that has been made spiritually alive, again, or a spiritual resurrection, being born again is another way of saying that, uh, is the act of God producing this new life and uniting that once dead heart that was separated from him, now uniting himself Uh, uniting himself with that individual, with that soul. That soul is now alive because it is connected to Christ. And we know this because the Holy Spirit is actually coming in and dwelling within within the individual. And there is a uniting there where you were separated from God and now you are united to God. Uh, There is actually an entire doctrine called the doctrine of union, that we are united in Christ. If you read the book of Ephesians, you will hear that trend and theme over and over again. Now, in this passage of scripture, Paul is attempting to clarify with the uttermost force and um, distinction that outside of Christ, this is your biography. Outside of being born again and resurrected and regenerate, this is the description of who you are, or it is the description of who you were. It is the description of those people who have not been born again. And this is the really the totality of the discussion over the last two weeks or last week and this week. And so um, in the previous episode, we learned about humanity's unrighteous state, their inability to comprehend uh, spiritual things because they're spiritually dead and you cannot comprehend spiritual matters if you're not spiritually alive. Um, there, It was about their unwillingness to seek for God. There was no interest There was no desire to seek for God. And we also learned about their powerlessness to do anything that was good because even their good works were filthy rags because they weren't done to the glory of God. They were done separated from the life of God, separated in a a posture to bring self-glorification or self-righteousness to present themselves to God, but they weren't actually done uh, from a regenerate heart to the glory of Christ. So today we shift the matter from the dead heart Uh, to the materialization of that heart in the life of an individual who is not saved. And again, this is a biography of who we were prior to Christ. And if you want to read Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul writes, and you were dead, this past tense, you were dead, and then it goes down to verse 4 in chapter 2, and it says, but God made us alive. And so there's this between verses two or chapter two, verse one through three, it gives you again, a a similar description of what we see here in Romans chapter three, verses 10 through 18. And so the section we're going to read right here is the universal acts of man. It's going to be verses 13 through 18. I'm going to read it right now. It says, their throat is an open grave with their tongues. 
they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, so in describing a wicked person, uh, Jesus said in Luke 6.45, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, In this verse, Paul really includes the fullness of the mouth or the organ of communication, which would be uh, the throat, the lips, the tongue, and the mouth. And he's showing a totality uh, that's occurring here. He's demonstrating that uh, wicked men pour out their wickedness through or out of their mouths. And this is absolutely true. And uh, we can see this in reality. We can see this in our own experiences. Now, some of you know that I have a somewhat significant following on social media, and I get to see a lot of the mouth being poured out in the comment section of my posts. Uh, Just last week, I posted about the immodesty of women that occur during the Halloween season and how the normal cultural uh, perspective on modesty somehow shifts and allows women essentially to dress like prostitutes and nobody notices. Uh, Actually, we all know that they do notice it and we know that fallen men appreciate that and we know what's really going on. But I made this post and Uh, on Twitter, it had over 5,600 comments of the most vile, evil, demonic, wicked, dark comments from both men and women. It was really like Satan's sewer just draining out in my comment section of my post. And this is what we should expect. It's really a fire hose of, of the heart. And so if the heart is dead and it has no life and it loves sin and it's not united to Christ, it's actually united to sin. It's not alive to Christ. It's actually alive to sin. We should expect the mouth to be a fire hose of death. And that's exactly what is true with our own personal experience, especially if you're on social media. But it's also true if you just watch the news or you have your own personal experience with relationships. Now, words are no small thing. Words are no small thing. We know this because Jesus in Matthew 12, 36 to 37 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. End quote. There will actually be a time where every one of those individuals that are writing these vile comments in my uh, comment section on Twitter will actually stand before the judge and give an account for every word that they said against God's law, against God's righteousness, against one of God's saints. This is absolutely true. And this is what this passage uh, in principle is teaching. Um, It also talks about how vital words are. We know that Romans Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. This is another moment where you see the connection between the heart and the mouth. And so the heart is, when it's dead, it spews out wickedness and evil. Uh, But when the heart is made alive, uh, it says that, for with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So the, the, the really the substance of the mouth shifts when the heart shifts. And that's what's being taught here. In a very real way, um, the mouth is a mirror to the state of the soul. And so, yes, we know that, that saints sin and saints still say terrible things. But generally speaking, the mouth is a mirror to the state of the soul. And, and uh, there is one-off occurrences of failure and sin, but the general normative flow of a person's mouth can really tell you about the state of their heart. And so if, again, the soul is dead, then the mouth will spew out death 
And if the soul is alive, the mouth will sing out life and will be fruitful and joyful and filled with things of the Lord. And this is the exact imagery that Paul is using here. The throat um, is really, the throat of the wicked, I should say, is really, as he says, is an open grave. And so the grave is is the heart and the throat is opening and uh, it really emits fumes of death. So there's some kind of unique poetic uh, language here that is really articulate in explaining uh, what is true. The tongue is a tool of, of deception is what Paul says here in, uh, what is it? It says, with the, their tongues, they keep on deceiving in verse 13. And the, it says, their lips are poison and intended to kill. They are weapons intending to pierce. And so one thing that I think about uh, is there's a relationship here that what, in doing my study, I thought this was really interesting. There's a relationship here. There's a parallel between, uh, we know that the enemy, Satan, is basically explained as a serpent. And how do serpents kill? They kill with their mouths, with their fangs. Um, and so there's some sort of association here with their lips being poison. Um, you know, the, I'll read the passage again. With their tongues, they keep on deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Th there is a relationship here, a corollary between um, the uh, the serpent and those who are submitting to the to their master, which is the serpent. And there is a corollary between those who have been made alive and their relationship with their mouth uh, to Jesus Christ and being redeemed. And so some interesting stuff there, but essentially they are venomous like their father, the devil. Um, ultimately their mouths are just full of hate. And so you can, you can spend just about five minutes on my Twitter account and receive a full HD manifestation of this passage of scripture. And you can go, wow, that is true. That's exactly true of these people who don't love the Lord. It's absolutely brutal and should by the evidence validate what the apostle is actually saying uh, in this passage of scripture about the heart and soul of man. So the evidence is robust, meaning that Paul is saying, when you're spiritually dead, you spew out death. So if the evidence supports that claim, then we can say that that claim is also reliable. And, and so this is a very helpful way to examine and evaluate what the scriptures are saying is that they come back true. Wicked man is not righteous. Uh, wicked man does not uh, understand God, does not seek for God, does not allow uh, for the righteousness of God, does not follow God, does not do any good. And he has proven that all those things are true by his mouth. Uh, he has um, he has proven that he is disinterested, doesn't understand, hates God. All those things come out of his mouth. And so he must be what? Mercifully, graciously, sovereignly, resurrected from the heart uh, in order for him to do anything that would be glorifying to God. So let's read verses 15 through 17. It says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So the apostle moves from the mouth to the body. And so there's a sense of, of he's covering different parts. He was maybe covering the mind even before in verses 10 through 13. He's going to the mouth. He's going to the body. He's demonstrating a total depravity of the entire being of a lost person. And that's really what that doctrine means. It doesn't mean that we are as bad as we could be. We know that common grace uh, really prevents those things uh, from occurring. God's, God's actually restraining evil in the world. But there is a total depravity, meaning that the heart, uh, the dead heart de depraves our mind, it depraves our thoughts, it depraves our words, it depraves our bodies, it depraves our actions, it depraves our entire being. We are totally depraved. And that's really what the doctrine means. So bloodshed 
Um, as it talks about here, their feet are swift to shed blood. Bloodshed is the biography of mankind. We know this to be true. Uh, history is violent and it's full of chaos and carnage. Um, every war, riot, bombing, shooting, and murder attest to the truth of the apostles' claim. Now, you guys know that I'm a post-millennial and I do believe that we are gonna start to see over the next centuries to come and millennia to come that as the gospel uh, continues to be proclaimed and the Lord continues to save and turn sinners into saints, that there will be a reduction of evil in the world. Now, it might not happen in the next 50 years, but I believe that we are actually seeing a reduction of evil in the world. I know it might not feel like that because we have amplified it with the internet, but the reality is, is that, you know, a millennia or two ago, we were watching lions and bears eat people alive for sport. And, and we're not doing that now. Prostitution was widespread and legal. That is not true now. Um, there is far more laws and things that are going on that, that have really shown that there is actually an improvement, generally speaking, in morality. Now, we know that God's sanctification of the world and the progress of the Great Commission is like a, uh, can, can be viewed almost like a stock market from our perspective. It looks like it's going up and then down and then up. But if you zoom out, generally the trend is going upward is that there are more Christians in the world than there was 500 years ago. And there were more Christians then than there was 500 years before that. And there were more Christians then than there was 500 years before that, that the Lord is continuing to convert the masses. And we should ask ourselves the question, why would we ever consider, why would we ever think that that would stop? If Christ is at the head of his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the kingdom of God is like leaven that will leaven the entire lump. Why would we consider that the church would get smaller? It's not, it's gonna to continue to grow and get bigger. But however, we do have this historical reality that the fallenness of man is painted across the pages of history and, and the wars and the shootings and the child uh, school shootings and the suicides and all these things are, are all over here. And I'm not saying that there will be a point where there will be no sin. I am just saying that the Lord is gonna continue to permeate the earth with his gospel and the great commission will be fulfilled. And we can have hope that the church will continue to grow and the world will continue to lose to King Jesus. And so when we talk about just the, the raw numbers of wickedness, you know, because it's really easy. Self-love is blinding. It's easy for us to think that we're not as bad as we really are. Let me just give you an idea, just a picture. Historically, uh, John MacArthur cited in one of his books from, I think it's from maybe 20, 30 years ago. He says, even in the United States with its Christian heritage, since the turn of the 20th century, twice as many of its citizens have been slain in private acts of murder than have been killed in all the wars of its entire history. So there has been more death in private acts of murder in America than we have experienced in all of the wars, revolutionary, civil uh, war, uh, World War One, World War Two, you know, Korean War, uh, all the, you know, the uh, Vietnam War and so forth. There has been more acts of private murder than than casualties of all those wars combined. And so we are absolutely experiencing and seeing the truth of this passage of scripture reign true here on earth historically. Now, he says uh, in this passage here, verse 17, and the path of peace they have not known. So ultimately, peace is foreign to mankind. It's foreign. Uh, civility is the only possible uh, path, uh, which is in again by God's grace that keeps civility going. Is that it's uh, you know what are some other things that keep civility? Uh, the fear of punishment and consequences. I'm not going to murder that person because I don't want to go to jail, um, or there's some sort of personal benefit for civility. I, I like it that my neighbors don't steal my things. Um, so I'm going to, you know, sustain my desire to steal and destroy uh, because I, I, it actually benefits me. Um, but true peace, again, that peace that's fueled by love is unknown uh, to the world. Now, again, my argument earlier for the post-millennial view is that uh, I don't believe that the world's going to change and all of a sudden 
uh, everything's going to start getting better. I, I think that the gospel is gonna, going to continue to permeate and infiltrate the culture as it has. It, we started with what, 12 guys that uh, basically go out with the Great Commission. And so we're talking about 0.0.0, you know, 1% of the population is Christian in the world. And now we're at 31% of the world's population confesses Christ. I know that's an inflated number and that not every individual actually is converted. But the reality is, is that number is massive and it's continuing to grow. And it's because the Great Commission will not stop and Jesus will not stop converting sinners into saints. And so we can trust that we are going to see some sort of a reduction uh, it doesn't mean that sin's going to go away. And there's still going to always be true that people that are lost, it, this biography will be true of them. But we are going to see that there is hope for the church and that the world will continue to be redeemed because God loves the world. First um, John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So the the ability to love is dependent upon your relationship with the Lord. Now, the world's form of love, which isn't real love, because real love has uh, a concern for eternity. Real love has a concern for your relationship with the Lord. Um, worldly love, uh, which is really a form of lust or a form of, you know, maybe camaraderie uh, or whatever, whatever it may be, is not a biblical definition of love. Uh, a biblical definition of love must be glorifying to God. And so the people that don't know God don't actually love according to scripture. They have a form of love, but it's not a biblical form of love. And so uh, this is something that therefore, because they don't have love, they can't have, uh, it's, it's, it's again, representative of their lack of a relationship with God. God is love. And therefore they can't have the other fruits of the spirit, which is peace joy. And so these are, again, we, we have superficial peace. We have superficial joy, uh, but we're not actually having true peace. We're not having true joy. We're not having true love because those things are only true when our souls are connected to the source of those realities, which is God. And so Paul closes with this uh, description of the cause. And, and, you know, he just finished doing this awful, you know, comprehensive explanation of mankind. And then he sums it up with the source of all of it. Why? why? Why is it like this? Why do we behave this way? Why do we not understand? And why do we not seek for God? And why do we have no desire? Why can't we do good? And why do we let death flow out of our mouths? And why do we uh, you know, try to kill people and murder people? And why do we not have peace? And why do we turn our own way? Why? Uh, it's this, the summation of that is really answered in verse 18. It says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And this statement is taken from Psalm 36, 1, which says, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, end quote. Um, the fear of the Lord is an important theological maxim. I wish we had time to do an entire episode on the fear of the Lord. You could do a 25-part series on the fear of the Lord. The term, the fear of the Lord, is used 127 times in the Old Testament and 25 times in the New Testament. Now, the frequency uh, difference between those two testaments is only because the page count is different. The Old Testament is much thicker and longer than the uh, than the New Testament. So there is still an ongoing, consistent trend of the fear of the Lord in the New Testament. Now, the fear of the Lord is not being afraid of the Lord. There's a difference there. Fear really is this reverential comprehension of understanding your place before the Lord. Uh, it, it is a good thing. Um, it is not that you are afraid of, of the Lord. It's not that, uh, you know, a, a father that has a good relationship with his children, his children should have a reverential fear for their father in the sense that, um, you know, my son doesn't smack my wife in the face when he gets angry because there's a reverential fear there. But my son is not afraid of me because he knows that I love him. And so there's far more metaphors and analogies that are probably more proficient than the one that I just gave. But the 
the the reality is the fear of the Lord is a vital hallmark of scripture. In fact, if you look at the wisdom literature, which is Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes, those three books in the Old Testament are bookended with the concept of the fear of the Lord. If you read Proverbs chapter one, uh, verse seven, it the opening, uh, the concluding stanza of that first proverb is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, so you have that as the opening side. Now in the, uh, in the final stanza of the book of Ecclesiastes, which is, you know, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, he is contemplating all the things of life and he concludes his book with this statement. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So ultimately the most essential principle in life for man is to know his place before his God, that he needs to know that he is created and that he has a creator. And that creator has the right to tell his creation how they ought to live. Um, But more than that, because this creator is perfect and holy and just, his creatures must know that God must punish those creatures who sin against his will. And that's how we have a just God. And this is really the exact problem that man has. There is no fear of God before their eyes, is what Paul says here. There is no submission. They are insubordinate. They are rejecting God's right over his creation. And there is no awe of his majesty. There is no respect for his jurisdiction. There is no reverence for his authority in their life. Uh, There is no concern for his commands. Again, man is insubordinate, out of submission, um, self-ruling, wanting to be God themselves. Uh, This is, again, part of the fall in, in Genesis 3 is to be like God. That is the fundamental flaw of mankind. I I will say something as kind of a caveat. Just because we don't fear the Lord as fallen man doesn't mean that we don't fear. Man is full of fear. It's full of the wrong fear. Um, They fear rulers. They fear consequences. They fear death. They fear worry. They fear anxiety. They fear, uh, you know, conflict. They fear all these different things. They, They fear shame and guilt. They fear pain. They fear sickness. Uh, they fear these things and they fear them all more than they fear God. I once counseled a gentleman who was looking at inappropriate content on the internet. And I remember his statement to me that his chief fear was the anger of his wife that, that continued to come out. And for that reason, he refused to tell her of his transgression against her in their marriage. Uh, In other words, really, he he feared his wife more than he feared God. His main concern wasn't that he sinned against God. He was afraid of the consequences. It wasn't even a concern for his wife. He was afraid of the consequences that would be afflicted upon him. Obviously, this was indicative that he wasn't regenerate. Uh, His concern wasn't for the Lord. He didn't have the fear of the Lord before his eyes. He had no problem sinning this way as long as his wife didn't need to know. So yes, he, he, he didn't feel bad about the sin. He felt guilty about getting caught. He felt guilty about his uh, shame. Um, he felt um, concerned about uh, you know, the consequences would come as a result of being known about these realities. Uh, and his concern wasn't primarily with breaking God's will for his life, uh, but the consequences and shame that would come as a result. And so th- that's pretty common. We fear these things but it's a misplaced fear. We have a misprioritization of fear. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. Oswald Chambers once said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Uh, the great Puritan wi- writer, William Gurnall um, said, quote, we fear men so much because we fear God so little. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once said, 
when man's terror scares you, turn your thoughts to the wrath of God. Uh, John Flavel said, the carnal person fears man, not God. The strong Christian fears God, not man. The weak Christian fears man too much and God too little, end quote. Now, I think out of all these statements on fear, these quotes on fear, I think Tozer, A.W. Tozer, hits the nail on the head when he says, no one can know the true grace of God who is not first known the fear of God. See, the fear of the Lord is essential. It's an essential ingredient to understand God and his gospel, to understand the grace and mercy that's been extend, extended to us in Christ. We must also first know the fear of the Lord for violating his commandments and the wrath of God coming for us. Essentially, we have to know the bad news before the good news can be good. We have to know the sickness uh, before the healing will be accepted. We have to be wounded by the law and the fear of the wrath of God before we can be healed with the ointment of the gospel. This is absolutely true. Um, and this is actually one of the prime components uh, and fundamental features of the new covenant. And th this constant maintenance for maintaining a healthy fear of the Lord, it's something that every Christian should cultivate within themselves is a, is a continuing, sustaining fear of the Lord, uh, according to scripture. And the beautiful thing about the new covenant is that God promises to sustain the fear of himself in us. And that's in Jeremiah 32, 40. He says, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. So there's a purpose clause there. The word that signifies a purpose clause. It says, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that uh, for the purpose of uh, the reason why that they may not turn from me. The fear of the Lord is actually the means of maintaining our faithfulness to God. And so these individuals that Paul's talking about who don't have the fear of the Lord before their eyes, it's why they've turned their own way. And they don't have a relationship with God. They don't seek the things of God because they don't have a fear of the Lord. And so again, our, our fear of God is the means for maintaining our faithfulness to God. And God says that he will keep the fear of himself in us in the new covenant. Again, as I said last week, the best part about the new covenant is that God doesn't just keep his part. He keeps your part. He'll sustain your faith. He'll keep your fear of him. It's really a, a part of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. He, it's the once saved, always saved doctrine. He will maintain that in you to be assured that we will never turn from him. But this is Romans 3, uh, 9 through 18 or 10 through 18, is that sad state of man apart from God's grace. Uh, we are all outside of God, guilty, ignorant, disinterested, blind, lost, wayward, evil, and insubordinate. That is our biography. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, if any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him, for you are far worse than he thinks you to be. And this is true. We are absolutely worse than what people think we are. We also, again, self-love is blinding. And so it's very easy to think highly of ourselves when in reality, we need to actually study this passage of scripture to realize how totally depraved we were, how helpless and hopeless we were without the saving and sovereign grace of Christ coming in upon our lives and rescuing us and saving us, not with our permission, without our permissions. If we had a choice, we would absolutely reject it every single time. And that's the doctrine of irresistible grace is that God will overcome our resistance to save his people. This is the beautiful truth of the gospel. And so an honest grasp of man is utterly essential for an honest grasp of grace. An honest grasp of man and your state, your moral state, your depraved state is an 
is essential for your honest grasp of grace and the gospel. When we realize how impossible and grave our station was prior to Christ, we will see the mercy of God with new eyes. When the uh, consequences that we were saved from are so grave, we will appreciate in greater degree our Savior. And so this is, again, essential for us to experience the grace of God. Um, we can truly understand what Jesus meant when he said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. We were incapable unless God acted first. God needed to act first and regenerate our heart so that we would start seeking and searching and he would give us faith and he would sustain us. And this is the grace of the gospel in the face of the total depravity of man. So hopefully this episode was helpful as a conclusion of part two on the doctrine of total depravity as we make our way through Romans. I'm excited to continue down the journey through Romans, finish out chapter three, get into chapter four, five, six, seven, eight. Man, these are some incredible chapters. So stay on the journey with us. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode. If you are a regular listener to this podcast, would you guys leave a review? You don't need to write something. You could just tap the stars. But if you do write something, I will read it. And those uh, those statements, those comments are very encouraging and they do help uh, getting the show more exposure to new people. And so thank you for joining me on this episode of Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge and I'll see you next week.